I am super excited to be here with you all on this Friday. Again, shout out to DJ C. Devon, who is going to be doing interlude music with us, keep our spirits up, our happiness at its height, um, and to keep us on our feet and on our toes throughout today's uh, program, which is Breaking the Stigma, a Mental Health Digital Summit. So happy Friday to everybody. My name is Natalie Madeira Cofield, and I am the founder of Walker's Legacy. Named in honor of Madam C.J. Walker, Walker's Legacy was created with a mission to cultivate an ecosystem of access designed to inspire, equip, and engage a global network of professional and entrepreneurial women of color. You can learn more about Walker's Legacy by joining us online at www.walkerslegacy.com. So let's go ahead and get started with today's program. May is Mental Health Awareness Month. Did you know that one in five people will experience a mental illness during their lifetime? Everyone faces challenges in life that can impact their mental health. Breaking the Stigma, a mental health digital summit aims to bring awareness, teach coping mechanisms, and provide useful tools through engaging conversation from various mental health professionals. I am super delighted today to introduce the speaker for our first session, Shanti Das. Shanti, are you with us? I am. Hey, Shanti. Hi, Natalie. Hello. First off, you have a name that just makes you happy, right? Shanti, oh. I feel like you have to smile when you say Shanti, okay? Can I tell you it means peace in India, which was my dad's native land, Natalie. Oh, okay. See, I told you it made me want to smile. Okay. <laughs> and now I'm hearing this. So that's good. Now, Shanti, for, for some reason. Okay. I see you now. I didn't see you before. Awesome. So I'm super excited to have you, Shanti. Thank you for taking time out of your day um, and out of your week to join us. So let's, let's talk a little bit about who Shanti is. Shanti is an accomplished entertainment industry veteran, speaker, author, and philanthropist. Shanti worked in the entertainment business for over 25 years. Her music industry career from intern to executive vice president included positions at several labels where she worked directly with some of music's top talent like Outkast, Usher, Prince, TLC, Tony Braxton, Erica Badu, and more. As a result of Shanti's extensive community work in the decade, the 2000s, she decided to establish her own nonprofit, the Hip Hop Professional Foundation. The foundation was rebranded under the name Silence the Shame, and we're going to get into that a lot, Shanti. I am so proud of and inspired by the campaign that you have created. Oh, thank Shanti. you. Yep. Silence the Shame, the mental health movement that led the way since 2016. Shanti has suffered from depression, anxiety over the years, and has also experienced loved ones affected with mental health disorders. Silence the Shame has received global awareness and has become a commonly used hashtag to normalize the conversation around mental health in America. Shanti's foundation curates community conversations, content, broadens awareness and education around mental health and wellness. And I'm just going to stop by saying in 2018, Shanti published her own book, Silencing My Shame, sharing her journey on her own emotional health and wellness journey and how she turned her pain and struggles into passion to start a global movement. So without further ado, I hope you all join me in welcoming Shanti Daz to today's conversation. Hi, Shanti. Lee, and I just want to congratulate you on everything. It's an honor to be here today to support Walker's legacy and everything that you're doing for women of color and entrepreneurs around the world. Oh, I appreciate that, Shanti. That means a lot to me yes. uh, because I feel the same way about you. Um, I am also someone who deals with anxiety and depression, um, and it is something that I've seen other entrepreneurs go through, and other notable executives, and it's, it is something that people are very, very silent about because they're afraid and ashamed. And so uh, one of my good friends, Jewel Burks, actually, um, who I think you know, you know she, yes. of course, she used to be our Atlanta city director. Uh, and then has gone off to be like the yes. most amazing woman in the world, you know, soon to be president of the United States. Yes. Uh, <laughs> but she actually introduced me to your campaign and um, oh, wow. it really touched me and resonated with me. And I'm excited to have you here as we talk during this moment. I mean, man, look at the time that we're in, Shanti. I gotta tell you, I woke up just with a heavy heart. Um, 
the young man that was arrested on CNN, the reporter, he's actually my friend's son. Mm. And it, well, she, his mom was my sister's best friend since the second grade. And I lost my sister last year unexpectedly. So I hope this is a forum that, where if I need to cry today, Natalie, I can, because it's a lot of emotions going on. It's a lot to process. Um, I think the trauma that we're experiencing as people of color right now is at an all time high, you know, not only with many of us passing from COVID-19 with pre-existing health conditions and the disparities and the lack of access to health care and mental health and physical health, physical health. And then now what's going on from a, a traumatic perspective in terms of racial tension. It's, it's just a lot to process. And I just, I'm grateful to be on here today to share because now more so than ever, our emotional health and wellness is so important, Natalie. It is, it absolutely is. And yes, this is a free forum. Um, I think, you know, one, people were dealing with something anyways, right? Which is just life, right? Which in, in and of itself is a tough journey. It is a journey. Um, mm -hmm. And then to add on top of that economic insecurity, mm -hmm. to add on top of that, just the lack of being able to see a future, which if you deal with anxiety is already something that you're <laughs> already struggling with, to That's plan right. for a future, to build a future, to know the future. Um, and then you add on top of that, this layer of you're not important enough to society. And when I say that, I'm talking exactly about what you're talking about with the, the murders of black men and women around the country, um, senselessly and intentionally in some instances, mm -hmm. um, it's a lot, you know, it's, it's make me want to holler moment, you yeah. know? And we're all going through this, Some people are going through it at their home, in their homes by themselves. Mm -hmm. Other people are going through it in a home with someone they don't want to be with. Ooh, yes, Mary, <laughs> say that again. <laughs> right, just because you ain't alone don't mean you ain't alone, you That's know? Right. Right. <laughs> um, and so it really, it really has, it just put us in this very vulnerable place of having to be in our skin. Mm -hmm. and sit in that for, for a while. I mean, I woke up this morning, I had a hard day too. So let me ask you some questions, Shanti. Um, I'm going to interweave a lot of stuff from what we're talking about, my personal experience, your personal experience into our discussion. But before we get into everything, you know, I would love for you to talk to us about your illustrious 25 year career in the music industry. What did you see? What did you experience? What inspired you to go into that space and what inspired you to come out of it? Okay, so I started, wow, I would say in 1991. I was a sophomore at Syracuse University. Um, I was in the Newhouse School of Communications. I thought I wanted to be either a radio announcer or a sports announcer, and I also was a college radio DJ, so I really immersed myself in the entertainment culture on campus, and I went back home, you know, during the summers to Atlanta, Georgia, and started interning at Capitol Records, and then I met some folks over at LaFay. So when I graduated from Syracuse in 93, that's why it's important never to burn bridges, because the gentleman that hired me at Capitol started consulting for LaFace and he said hey LaFace has this promotions uh, director um, uh, opportunity available and I was like I don't know what that is but I'll take the interview right. and so you know God is good I got the interview the first record I ever worked was uh, Players Ball from Outcast. I, hey. I went on tour that year with Tony Braxton she was opening up for Frankie Beverly and May so I got to do a lot of her meet and greets and then I went on to work with Usher and TLC and so many other incredible artists um, in the LaFace family. And then when LA and Babyface sold the company in 2000, I moved up to New York City and became senior director of marketing at Arista Records. I was there for about a year and a half. And uh, I would say that's probably when I first started dealing with a lot of adversity in the workplace because LaFace was more of a boutique label. You know, it was a family environment and we all got along. And you know, families fight, but you make right. up. So it was just a different kind of environment. So when I got to Arista, it was more of a corporate setting and it was, you know, a different regime of folks. And a lot of my peers weren't there from LaFace and it was just a lot to take in. And my direct report at the time was very condescending. I felt like I was being overlooked for opportunities. Um, some of my white male counterparts didn't make it as easy for me. And 
that is when I first uttered the words because I, I felt like I had an emotional breakdown at the airport one day. I was literally at LaGuardia. I was headed to Miami for a video shoot with MTV for Babyface because he was, he had done an, um, a deal with Aris at the time. And I just broke down, Natalie. And I said to my sister, I said, you know, I'm, I'm tired of this. I can't take it anymore. And I uttered the words, maybe I should just kill myself. And it really scared me because my dad took his own life when I was seven months old and we didn't talk about it as a family. So I already had a lot of layers of trauma and frustration from my father's suicide that I never properly addressed. And that was difficult for me. And that's when I first started going to therapy shortly thereafter. And I went for a couple of months and then I did what most people do. I felt like I was okay. So I stopped going to therapy and kind of buried myself back into my work. So I went on to work for Columbia Records and Sony Urban Music. And then I ended at Universal Motown as Executive Vice President of Marketing, working directly under Sylvia Rohn. Had an incredible career, you know, living out of a suitcase, going to all the award shows, everything that we think is really awesome and fun, and it was. But, you know, self-care and mental wellness, we didn't talk about it back then. It wasn't a thing. It was always hashtag team no sleep. The longer you worked, yeah. you celebrate it. You, yeah. you would celebrate it rather. And, but it, the, I never really thought about what it was doing to my body physically, as well as to my mind and, and my spiritual um, being. And so it took a toll on me in 2009. I was at the top of my game now. I thought maybe I would go on to become president of a label or general manager or start my own company. But in 2009, my mom developed Alzheimer's. Uh, my uncle who helped to raise me passed away. Mm -hmm. And I developed what was called cervical spinal stenosis. My entire right side went numb one day when I was in New York City and it scared me to death. And the doctors said that it was because of stress mm -hmm. and that I was just, my body, I was so stressed out that it was manifesting itself through physical illnesses. And so I quit and I walked away very difficult decision, uh, but I left it all on the table. The money, the corner office, the fame and all that. And I moved back home to Atlanta, started doing more community service work. So I felt like there was like this spiritual war going on in my head. And I was like, God, why are you pushing me to do more work in the community when this is my life? Music is my life. And so, you know, I had some financial setbacks, some ups and downs as an entrepreneur, as we all know, you know, you might have a couple of months with good clients and then the well is dry for the next yeah. quarter. So that was difficult. And then in 2014, my best friend took her own life. And I had talked to her the day before it happened. And that, of course, took a toll on me. And then in 2015, Natalie, I came really close to taking my own life. Mm -hmm. I had counted up all the pills in my cabinet. And everything just kind of came to a head. My dad's suicide, my best friend, you know, what I was supposed to be doing in life. I just didn't see a way out. And thank God I got the help that I needed. And that's kind of how I started this mission of silencing my own shame. No, oh, Shanti. Um, I think it's so powerful that you're able to vocalize that in a public setting and feel empowered by it. It's still hard. I won't, I won't lie to you. You know, every time I tell someone I thought about killing myself, you know, I feel it in my gut and in my soul. But I, I do feel a sense of empowerment because I feel like, you know, God is always there with me and he's allowing me to be vulnerable and transparent. And I hope and pray that it's helping somebody else. So if I can save one life, then I'll continue to say what happened to me and how I got through it. Absolutely. And I, and I think you know, even in saying that, I'm more than sure, given that I know that you have spoken at countless programs and countless seminars across the country, that for every one time you say that, someone comes up to you and says, I thought it was just me. And that there is a moment of community that exists there that you create through your honesty. And honestly, I'll tell you that that's also been me. So really? they, Yes. So I told you I suffer from anxiety as well. Yeah. And so that has also been me. And I've never really been able to vocalize it. Um, and I think when you're in a space, as you talked about, when you're in, a, when you're in these high pressure spaces where you're an entrepreneur, I always joke and say, if, if someone has never been broke in their business before, they've never really been an entrepreneur, right? right. Exactly. <laughs> or, or they just like had all this money before. Right. Uh, but there are moments in your, in your, in your entrepreneurial journey where you have it and you don't have it. You have it and you don't have it. 
And sometimes it's tough to get through those types of moments, particularly when, as you probably have experienced, you're at top, you're at top of game, you're here, you're there, you're on this cover, you're in this place, you're in that place. And, you know, a lot of celebrities, which I know you know, deal with this because there is a, there is a misnomer about being famous and being successful all at the same time. And success is defined by financial success, personal success, uh, social uh, success, emotional, spiritual success. It's not just about how much money you have in your bank account. So you can be all over the world and be empty and be nowhere. Oh, you better say that again. Yes. And one of my mentors said to me, Natalie, the only address you'll ever need is is, is in your skin. Mm. That's the address that you always have to feel most comfortable with. Mm -hmm. And so I just, I just wanted to honor you by sharing that on my behalf. That's what I'm telling I've been looking forward to this conversation for a long time. You want to put me in this campaign now. Uh, yes, I'm I, please. Silence the shame we shirt. Need it. I'm, I'm mailing you a shirt this weekend. I, listen, honey, I, you go follow up because we're going to give you the Walker's <laughs> Legacy shirt. Yes, and I just want to say to your point, one of my dear friends, Sherry Riley, who is also a life coach and speaker, she coined this new phrase, peace is the new success. Mm. And it absolutely, absolutely is about your piece. And I also started a new platform through COVID-19, just trying to outreach to other celebrities called Yeah Wellness. So I interview a lot of celebrities every day on my IG. And yes, they're just like, you know, everybody else, you know, just because you have the money and the fame doesn't mean that you're hurting, doesn't mean that you don't deal with anxiety. And there is a level of loneliness, right, that exists within the celebrity life. And I've seen it over the years. And I always say like, my heart goes out to people that are constantly in the spotlight because it's a lot to take in emotionally. Yeah, it is. Cause you're absorbing other people's energy all day. Mm -hmm. That's right. And being who everybody wants you to be all day. And you know, in a micro way, we manifest that ourselves, right? Right. So at work. So while we're not, you know, not a you're not talking about, a one to millions ratio, right? You can't right. be talking about a one to two, one to 10, one to 20 ratio of who you feel you need to be at your workplace, who you mm -hmm. feel you need to be to maintain something and who you are and just absorbing a lot of energy from people into your spirit and into your space. It's, it's, Absolutely. Yeah, it's, 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 it can be overwhelming. It can be overwhelming on the journey to success to think about who it is that you feel like you have to become to get there. And then you add social media on top of that. And you're constantly looking at other people's pages. I like to call it the highlight reel. It's just so much pressure. It, it is. It is, actually. And then, okay, so, Shanti, let me ask you the next question, since we both kind of just shared and talked. When did you recognize that you, you suffered from or that you were dealing with anxiety and depression? Um, I think, you know, we have language for it today, right? Mm -hmm, so you can mm -hmm. say, this is what it is. But in the past, I don't know that there was actually language for it. And so when did that moment come for you where you, you said, this is, this is what it is? Great question. And so I think there was language in the past, but our community wasn't educated around it, right? We, we didn't talk about it. Uh, therapy is just for white people as we would hear growing up. So we didn't know how to recognize those behavior patterns and signs and symptoms. So I have to really credit again, my sister, because uh, when my dad took his own life, she helped to raise us and she started going to counseling in college and she was eight and a half years my senior. So <clears throat> she would often tell me like, I really think you need counseling. And I would say, oh no, I, I don't need counseling. And so the first time that I knew something wasn't right was back in 2001 when I mentioned the, you know, that I said, I, maybe I should just kill myself. And I went to the therapist and she taught me about things like feeling hopeless, you know, and, and when that is consistent, right? Because mental health is, another term is behavioral health. And it's based around our patterns and how much those symptoms and feelings and thoughts persist. We all have sad days, right? We all have bad days. But when that feeling starts to persist for weeks at a time, it starts affecting your livelihood. It starts affecting your families, how you interact with maybe your spouse or your children. Um, the fact that like there were days, Natalie, where, especially in 2015, like, I didn't want to get out of the bed. I didn't want to open the blinds. I knew something was wrong, right? Because we need sunshine. We need that vitamin D because it's been proven that it puts us in a better mood. I didn't want any of that. 
Mm-hmm. And I was high functioning still at the time because there are people who learned about my story and they were like, well, I would still see you out. And I was like, didn't mean I wasn't hurting, right? Yeah. I was really hiding a lot of this. My own brother didn't know. And I remember sharing my story at an event for the NFL and my brother was in the audience and I wept because that was two years after the fact that I thought about taking my own life. And I never even shared that with my own brother. My sister knew it and a few of my close friends and my pastor, but that journey of even contemplating suicide was really tough for me. And I struggled through, excuse me, opening up publicly and talking about it. And so I knew then that, you know, I was also abusing alcohol. I wasn't an alcoholic, but my social drinking was definitely not helping my depression because alcohol is a natural depressant. So that one drink would turn into two drinks, the two drinks would turn into three, and I would just find myself going into this downward spiral. And I was like, okay, alcohol is definitely not helping the situation. So my little one glass of wine in the evenings, I have to definitely put a halt on that. So it was a lot of my um, patterns that I started recognizing in myself that I knew really wasn't who I was at the core and the essence of my personality. Because I, I, even though I like to be by myself, I'm a people person. I love being around people. So the fact that I would start, you know, turning down invitations to go to parties and, and not wanting to be out and about and, you know, taking a meeting over the phone versus taking it in person. Like, I just wasn't comfortable being around people anymore because I couldn't stop these thoughts in my mind from racing. And so that's when I knew that, okay, something isn't right. And that night, it was in, it was the first weekend in September. And and it's funny, I posted the text message that I sent to my pastor that same night. And I was like, I am in a really dark place. You know, I need help. And he, he called me, of course, and he said, come to, to, to church the next morning. And I was there and I wept the entire time that I was at church because the fact that I, thought that I was so close to taking my own life like my dad and and what it would have done to my my family members and my friends and my peers it was just such an emotional day for me but thank God that I did get the help that I needed that next Monday I called my primary health care physician and he recommended me to a wonderful African-American female psychiatrist here in the Atlanta area I started taking my uh my antidepressants, I like to call them my happy pills. And it definitely got me back on track to feeling more like myself. I love it. Um, uh, Shanti, we have so much in common. I, I like literally listening to you thinking, thank you. Thank you for being a voice on these issues. Thank you for having this be your calling. Thank you for sharing your story. Thank you for releasing us. And I mean, I really mean that. Um, it's, it's, it's. Girl, it's, you about to make me start crying, Natalie? <laughs> I'm about to start oh, crying. Oh, Lord, because I'm just like. <laughs> you like. Can I just oh, tell you, like. This is oh, Chauncey, we can't be crying. I'm on sorry, show. but I told you that my spirit, this is hard work. I understand. I like, I bear my soul. I understand. And that's why. I'm trying to say people and save myself. And I still feel like some people don't take this seriously. And now I know mental health is being discussed a lot, but like we are really trying to help save as many lives as possible. And I have just, I have fought the spirit with God. Like, why me, Lord? Why do you want me to lead this charge and this fight around something that is so taboo in our country, in our world? But I have you know, accepted the challenge and I'm happy to do this work, but it is heavy work. And I just hope that people realize, especially with what's going on in society right now, that they know that now more so than ever, we got to protect our minds. We got to protect our babies. We got to protect our families. It really is mind, body, and spirit. Mental health should not be viewed as this thing over there. We all have mental health. We may not all have a mental illness. And that is so important. Stop saying this thing, mental health over there. We all have mental health. It is one thing. It's mind, body, and soul. It's nothing separate. I'm sorry. I just. No, don't. Please don't apologize. Don't. I'm telling you, we are, we are kindred spirits, Shanti. <laughs> so, no. Um, and I, 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 I will continue to honor your transparency and your authenticity. And I want you to, to feel comfortable being that way. Um, I wanted to talk about something that you just mentioned, which is that people, you know, I think a lot of times people say, oh, crazy, that person's crazy, this person's crazy, that person's crazy. 
and it's used so loosely. And, you know, one day I remember I was talking to someone, uh, one of my girlfriends, and, and she said that to me. And I just remember being like, you know, one, I told her about my dealings uh, with dealing with anxiety. Um, and I think for her, because mental health through work that you're doing and through work that others are doing has become so much more of a conversation piece. Mm -hmm. I said to her, when you just blanketly say something like that, number one, it sounds, it sounds ignorant and it sounds Mm ill-informed and also extremely insensitive. And it is in very many ways, similar to how people treat, um, you know, just saying someone is overweight or saying someone is this or saying someone is that. It's completely insensitive. And, 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 and the other piece of this is how many people feel that they can just like diagnose someone with something yes. um, and not really have a real sound basis for like what they're doing and, and the power of the words that they're speaking. Ooh, yes. Because all of these things are iterative, right? And so you can't just say this is what someone is dealing with. Um, so I wanted to hear your opinion about the use of language and vernacular as it, as it relates to disempowering people yeah. and as it relates to empowering them and being more informed. Absolutely. So words matter, absolutely, because the wrong words can continue to, um, you know, uh, foster stigma, right, in our communities. And so we have to be careful. You know, back in the day, uh, we had a cousin that suffered from schizophrenia and you know, my own family would be like, oh, your cousin's having another one of those fits. What is a fit? I mean, that's a Southern, you know, term that was used, a slang term back in the day. But once I got older and I learned like, no, he actually suffered from a mental illness and it's called schizophrenia, right? And once he took his medication, he was okay. But I felt like he was outcast from some of our events. And that is horrible. You know, I also have another family member that suffers right now and a lot of my family they still don't understand it and so i find myself trying to educate and tell people don't use this word you know it's no different than when someone says oh johnny he's bipolar no johnny's not bipolar johnny suffers from bipolar disorder so it is so important when you're talking about mental health illnesses and just mental health in general that we make sure that we're being really um, thoughtful, right, and present in the words that we're using. It's also important that we do things like mental health first aid training. That's something that Silence of Shame offers. It's a free eight-hour course, and we're starting. We're going to start implementing it virtually now, just with everything that's going on through COVID. But it teaches you about all the mental illnesses, all the languages that you can use, things that you shouldn't do that are harmful in terms of, you know, stigma still being, you know, very prevalent in the society. And so I just encourage you guys to learn about it, because if you do have someone that's suffering or even yourself, you want to make sure that we're protecting, you know, the peace and we're protecting the language that we use, because that can further send someone down a downward spiral, right? And it could really hinder the efforts in terms of treatment and care and how they can, you know, become well again. So it is extremely important that we monitor. I I always try to, um, you know, not in a, a, a nasty way, but I also try to, you know, make sure that I'm telling people like, please don't use that word. And, you know, I, I just hate that I have to find myself in that position so many times, but I have to teach and educate people so that, you know, we don't hurt people's feelings. That's no different than like when you fat shame somebody, right? Yeah. The same thing exists around mental health and wellness. You can't use the word crazy, right? And I, and I even hate like that person should be in a mental institution. No, that person should just go see a doctor and get help. You know, it's you, when someone has hypertension, you know, or high blood pressure, we don't call them high blood pressure. We say, right. no, they're suffering from hypertension, right? right? So let's start calling it what it is, right? right? Let's be really specific and thoughtful about how we label what the person is dealing with and how we can understand what it is so that we're not contributing to the stigma that still exists in America. Absolutely. No, I love that too, because the example that you gave about hypertension and high blood pressure, like all of these physical circumstances, physical and mental circumstances have um, symptoms and, and or right. have uh, side effects or have circumstances. So some proper people, diagnosis, like what is the proper diagnosis? What is it called? Exactly. And so thinking about it from the perspective of like, if you have high blood pressure, like maybe you, when you get stressed out, like your heart beats faster and you can't take stressful moments. That doesn't right. make you a weaker person. It just means that you're dealing with high blood pressure and the impact that it has on you. 
Um, and so I, I, I like that you said that. Shanti, one other word that you said that I, I, I really wanted to hone in on was functional. Mm. Because I think that people think that uh, dealing with anxiety and dealing with depression is, um, is very defined by, I can't get out of bed. Uh, and or, it's so debilitating that you can't move. <laughs> yes, it's paralyzing. Yeah. There are a lot of people who are dealing with a lot of things, right? that are extremely functional in their dealings with it. And to your point, people are like, well, I, I didn't, I would never have imagined because mm -hmm. we have typecast it to be completely debilitating or nothing. It's That's either right. with something or you're absolutely not. Can right. you talk to us a little bit about some of the functional components of what it means to be going through some of these circumstances and some of these conditions? Absolutely. So again, when I was, you know, dealing with my own suicidal ideation, you know, I was still, I had an event called ATL Live on the Park. I had to still go to rehearsal and do the bookings and try to be present. But on the inside, I was suffering so much. <clears throat> and I think we, you know, especially, um, you know, successful people, we have a tendency to like compartmentalize our feelings, right? So we say, okay, you know, I'm not going to deal with that. I'm just going to tuck this little thought away or tuck these feelings away and I'm going to keep moving. But what is the problem or what happens is when we do that, you know, it tends to manifest itself into physical problems in our body. So, you know, we can be moving, moving, you know, and going and going and not realize what's going on mentally and physically. And that's what I had to do. I had to really like kind of stop, acknowledge my feelings and process through them. I think the hardest part for someone who is a high achiever right, and is successful, is acknowledging the fact that something may be wrong, right? None of us want anything to be wrong, whether it's mentally or physically. And the fact that it's the brain and the mind, sometimes I think is so scary. And then again, because stigma exists so much, we don't want to deal with it. So we just go on, you know, through our day, our normal routine, acting as if nothing is happening. Even when family members and friends and maybe even coworkers say, hey, is everything okay? We go, oh, I'm fine right? Because we're too embarrassed or we're afraid. We let that fear, you know, lead us instead of really getting to the root of the problem. So the first thing we have to do is I think we have to prioritize our relationships. And that's even the relationship that you have with yourself, right? You have to be up and wake up every day and acknowledge how you're feeling. Like I acknowledge as soon as I got on this webinar, I have a heavy heart right now. It's a lot going on. So from an emotional, I'm really emotional. I'm also Pisces, but I'm really emotional this morning. So I had to acknowledge that thought, right? I had to acknowledge that feeling and I had to process through it. I was like, okay, God, let me, you know, try to pull myself together here. But I do know that I have a heightened level of anxiety right now. And when I was dealing with a lot of my own thoughts and feelings, I wasn't really acknowledging it. I was pretending and acting as if I was okay. And then it started happening so much, that's when I couldn't control my thoughts, right? I didn't have healthy coping mechanisms to get me throughout the day. I wasn't doing yoga. I wasn't working out. I didn't know about the 448 tech breathing technique, which is great if you're feeling, you know, anxious and you could do that and kind of recenter yourself. I didn't know about any of that. And I think that's why, excuse me, that it all kind of came to a head because I just didn't deal with it and I didn't know how to cope. So again, you have to be able to have, um, trustworthy people in your life, people that are empathetic, people that are understanding, because oftentimes our friend, family members, our friends, even our colleagues, sometimes they just don't get it, right? And it's because they are not educated around the subject. And that's why I'm so glad, you know, organizations like Walker Legacy, Walker's Legacy rather, is making mental health a priority and teaching people. But you got to be able to process through your fears and your anxieties and have people that can tell you what's really going on. The other thing that I think is important, when we ask somebody how they're doing, I don't really think some of us want to get the answer on the other side of it. It's just something that we say like, oh, hey, how you doing? Oh, I'm fine. So, and you just keep it moving. What, how are you going to respond to it if somebody says, you know what, I'm actually not doing okay. I'm not having a good day. Do you want that heaviness? Do you want that burden from that family member or friend to even have to process through it? So, you know, we got to allow ourselves some grace um, and be able to process through what we're going through and be able to acknowledge it. I want to, um, I want Hope to that answer. No, it totally did. Okay. And, uh, and it dovetails into another question that I'm going to ask um, about being um, supportive of someone. If you're in a relationship with them, whatever that may be, father, son, 
girlfriend, boyfriend, husband, husband, whatever, right? Mm -hmm. um, how, how, how do you support someone through these circumstances? But before I, I, I do that, I want to just share two things. One, um, for me, a lot of my life was spent working through that. When I say working, I mean like I would put a lot of work on my plate to not deal with those. Oh, to, yeah. To not try to deal with yeah. you know, how I was feeling. So if I felt very anxious or if I felt, you know, depressed about something, I just add more work to my mm. schedule to, mm. and that was my coping mechanism. And I realized that working a lot was helping me during that moment. Um, but then you get to a point where you <clears throat> mentioned Shanti, where you're in the airport. And I remember having a panic attack on an airline one time mm. and people around me were like, is this the first time that you've ever, you know, flown? And I'm yeah. like, I'm on a plane every other day. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> but I was literally sitting on the airplane, like breathing hard. Yeah. It just came over me. I don't know why it happened. It just really came over me and I started crying. It wasn't like, uh -huh, but it was like, I was tearing up and breathing mm -hmm. hard. And I was trying to like, okay, control myself. But there was nothing that had really happened. I think I was on the plane thinking about all the stuff that was going on and trying to figure well, out. Well, you were, you were sitting still for a moment and you finally had a chance to stop. Let's talk about it. And think about it because you talked about using work as, as a coping mechanism. You know, I'd be lying if I said, sometimes I still do that, right? As much as I know about emotional health and wellness, like losing my sister last year was the worst thing that could have ever happened to me. We were so close. I don't even think there are words to describe our relationship. All I know is I was texting with my sister at 10 o'clock that night and I get a call the next morning, six hours later, that she was gone within 15 minutes from a blood clot. Mm -hmm. Devastating. And so now I find myself that I'm working, I'm working, I'm working, and it's a good way for me to not have to think about it and process through the grief. But as soon as, baby, I sit still and think about it, the tears just start coming and coming and coming. That's why now I'm making sure that I'm talking to a grief therapist and that I have to be able to find ways to understand what the grief process looks like. I know I'm never gonna get over losing my sister, but I do know that there are some better days ahead and there's some better ways to cope. For me, not just to use work as an excuse, for me to not have to think about my sister's death. The same thing applies when you're talking about anxiety and stress, problems in the workplace, problems within your company. If you're a small business owner, we don't know what the future is going to look like. States are starting to reopen, but people are still really, really stressed out. We don't know if there's going to be any more loan money available in terms of PPE. Like it is just so, I mean, PPP is just so much going on and it's a lot of stress. And I bet you a lot of people are using work and using other things to continue moving. But as soon as they really slow down, it's going to hit them hard. And yeah. that's when they need to think about seeing a therapist. Um, that doesn't mean everybody has to be on medication. And it's important to note that there's a difference between a psychiatrist and a psychologist. A psychiatrist is a medical doctor. They prescribe medication. But the therapist is going to be the one who's going to talk to you and move through it and help you process things better. Absolutely. Um, and I'm excited to say that um, today we do. We have um, a psychiatrist, a therapist, um, someone that's who great talks to us about nutrition and wellness, because you're right. So much of this also is about how you, you cope with it. Some people cope by overworking. Some people cope by overeating. Some people cope by over drinking. Some people cope by over partying, over yes. uh, yes. trying to be a perfectionist. I mean, people are coping with circumstances and situations as best they can during, during not only just this pandemic, but yes. just the, the, the pandemic of, of life, right? Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> and, and the journey of, of, of their life. Okay, so um, let's talk about how do you support someone that you're in a relationship with of any variety that is dealing with something around anxiety and depression. And I wanna say something after you answer this about how I feel about people who are in these circumstances of dealing with mental moments, but go ahead. Yeah, sure. So I will say it's, it's really, um, it's difficult at times, you know, when people are adults, right? Because you can't make people get help. Um, if someone is suffering from a severe mental illness, that's very different than someone that may just be experiencing a mild case of anxiety or a mild case of depression, because oftentimes with people with severe mental illnesses, they need their medication 
to even survive and live. Um, so you have to try to, you know, encourage them to take their medication, you know, don't judge them, you know, check in on them as often as you can and, and, and just try to educate yourself around the severe um, mental illnesses because it can be a lot on the family. The one thing that we did as a family, I went to counseling services to learn how the family can support a family member. Like um, one of our family members was in an inpatient facility and they offered a lot of support groups for the family members. And that was just so critical for me and for our family in terms of understanding how to deal with our loved ones. So that's the first thing that I would say is go to support groups and learn as much as you can around supporting someone with a severe mental illness. If it's someone like your spouse or a friend that you think just may be struggling and may need some help, first and foremost, don't come from a place of judgment, right? We're so busy trying, especially high achievers. We wanna just fix the problem quick. We wanna fix you. We, we think we can call you and tell you what to do and fix you and that's all that you need. Sometimes we just need an ear. We just need somebody to listen to us, not from a place of judgment and that will help us through it. The other thing you can do is say, hey, you know, it, do you wanna talk? You know, I'm always here for you. So, you know, really be loving um, and supportive offer to maybe take them to therapist to a therapy session, um, offer to help them find a therapist, um, particularly um, for people of color. There's a such thing called cultural competency. So oftentimes we will want a therapist that looks like us, that can understand some of the struggles that we've been going through from our culture. So I would say do as much research as you can to support that person again you can't make that person do anything but i think maybe if you even like like silence or shame we post a lot of helpful articles on our facebook page maybe shoot them an article and say hey read this when you get a chance or i was just watching you know this piece of content this really inspired me check it out when you kind of put the onus on yourself and not on them as if something is wrong with them you could say you know what i was feeling really anxious the other day this really helped me Maybe it's a way for you to show something that you're doing to help yourself around emotional health and wellness, as opposed to saying, hey, I think something is wrong. Why don't you do this? Because we often, you know, we um, freeze up, you know, we get on the defensive when someone says something is wrong with us, and we don't know how to process through that. So take the onus off of that person, kind of put it on yourself, and then help them to realize what you're doing in terms of healthy coping mechanisms. Absolutely. I love it. Um, and I think you know, that kind of dovetails into the comment that I wanted to make, which is, I think sometimes people don't realize how strong you have to be to, to maneuver through life in these circumstances. Yes. I think, um, when we talk about mental health and we talk about these moments and we, you know, even talking about anxiety and, and, and or depression um, and thinking, you know, someone, oh, they, 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 they just had a panic attack or they're feeling anxious, you know, how weak of them, right? Mm -hmm. like, that's, this is normal everyday today life for someone else. Like, why are you having such a significant response to this? And not realizing how, how fundamentally strong you have to be to continue to keep getting up day to day, oh and, day, gosh, to day yeah. and day to day and day to day to continue to put yourself in harm's way, like harm's way, right? And, and on the front lines of this, that you have to continue to keep dealing with it. You have to continue to keep finding the motivation and the inspiration that to me is strong. That's actually strength because whereas for one person, it is so easy that it's almost something you don't even have to think about, mm -hmm. right? For someone else, they, and it takes so much interpersonal strength mm -hmm. for them to get through that moment. That is almost like, instead of thinking about how much of a deficit circumstance this is for them, oh, they're dealing with this, you could actually sometimes look at people and be in awe of them. Oh, for yeah. The, for the type of strength it takes to say, Shanti, I, you know, was feeling this way and I felt so motivated that I, I learned about it. I went to go get help about it. And not only that, and, you know, bringing this back to you, I'm now trying to help other people put language around this that is more constructive and conducive to dealing with it than what it takes for someone else who might just be able to roll out of bed and get moving and, and, and something else. Amen and absolutely. These are the real heroes, right? These are the people that get up every day, that struggle to get up, that sometimes even with the medication, even with the therapy, they're still going through it, but they're out there fighting the good fight. You know, my pastor, Dr. Raphael G. Warnock, when I was going through a lot, and even still now, he introduced me to this term, 
the wounded healer. Mm. And I feel like, yes, I am still wounded, but I'm getting up and, and fighting through this and praying that God gives me the strength that I need because you're absolutely right. It is the strength and the perseverance that gets us through this, that makes us the real warriors, the real superheroes, people that can find the coping mechanisms that they need to lead the best productive lives that they can lead. It is not easy, but it is absolutely something that we need to celebrate instead of frowning upon, right? We need to continue to erase stigmas in our communities because we all, if nothing more through COVID-19, have seen that everybody, I don't care how many businesses you got, how many dollar signs behind your name, anxiety, even at the most basic level, is something that we can all experience. And if you're not careful, right? It could lead to a severe mental illness. That is why these conversations are imperative. They're so important. Yes, May is Mental Health Awareness Month, but these conversations have to continue. And I look and I sit there and I go, God, like, okay, I've been, you know, I contemplated taking my own life in 2015. Here we are in 2020 in a pandemic. I got to tell you, Natalie, I've done so many Zooms, I can't even keep up and count because I just, I didn't want to tell anybody no. And, right. you know, shout out to Sarita, who's been working with me, and she brought this opportunity to the table. And I feel like God is like, this is your moment. This is, this is the March Madness for you. This is your yeah. one shining moment where you got to bring this knowledge to the people and you can't stop. You know, this is the ministry that has been put into your lap. You accepted this, you know, as one of, you know, my followers, if you will. And I'm just so inspired to do this work. And I just pray every morning, literally, not even every morning, I pray before every talk that I do, whether it's an IG live or a chat, that God gives me the strength to carry through and that I don't, you know, uh, get into this downward spiral again, right? Because even losing my sister kind of puts me in a dark place sometimes. So you're absolutely right. It is the strength of everyone that has been able to endure and to get on the other side, if you will. Um, and it's not that things will necessarily always be okay, but it is strength that lies in resilience and the ability to get the help that you need. Absolutely. Um, a absolutely, Shanti. This, this is your time. Um, this is our time. This is, this is our time. It's not yeah, just my it, time. Because it it's bigger than me. It is not about me. It is about the work and the ministry of healing so many people who for so many years, especially in our community, communities of color, have not taken mental health seriously. So it has, it's not about Shanti Dots. It is about silencing the shame and really spread, spreading the message of good mental health for everybody. Yes. I didn't mean just like No, you. I know, but I just had to say that. I, I don't want people to think it's about me. It's, I get it. it's bigger than me. I, and I appreciate you doing that. Where I was going with that was that it goes to a point that you made, and this is kind of in closing, about when you have to sit still. And we are all having, for the last two and a half months, now Atlanta, y'all already out in the streets and doing stuff. <laughs> Ooh, I know. Look, don't get me started. That's, that's another Zoom call. <laughs> but for two and a half months, we've all had to sit still. And we've all had to sit in our moment and sit with ourselves, sit with whatever the circumstances were. We had to sit in it. And so when I said that this is the perfect time, it, it, it's true because there was nowhere to go. There was nowhere to, how, way to really overwork. There was no way right. to, there was no, there was nowhere to truly escape the circumstance. And I think what it did was, and, and my hope is that it has elevated the, 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 the recognition of a lot of people, of a lot of things that they were dealing with, mm -hmm. desire for a lot of people to feel comfortable knowing that they can go to someone and speak to someone. Mm -hmm. It has improved accessibility. Mm -hmm. I have a therapist that I talk to on Zoom. As someone who travels all the yeah. time, it was hard for me to have a scheduled set meeting with my therapist mm -hmm. because I'm like, I, don't, I can't tell if I'm going to be in Sri Lanka or if I'm going to be in San Francisco. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> and I, like, I can't, and I don't want to keep canceling these meetings with you, but and now I think we're going to see a new phenomenon around telehealth as it relates to mental health and wellness. Oh, sure. And an easing of some of those to make it so much easier. At, my, um, at Walker's Legacy, I actually offered to uh, pay for a month, uh, one therapy session a month for everybody on my team. Um, oh, amazing. Health, health insurance. Because I know how impactful and important it has been for me. And it's a work 
it's a work in progress. So I just want to close Shanti by asking you, you know, if there's any words of encouragement or advice that you can give to, to, to those who are listening to us today on how to continue to keep finding the strength and inspiration to move forward in every aspect of their life. Yeah, so again, thank you for having me on today. I'm sorry I got all emotional, but uh, this was a really um, great talk and, and I appreciate it. The one thing I just continue to say is I have to go back to the word grace. You got to allow yourself some grace, right? We are so oftentimes so hard on ourselves and <clears throat> the fear of the unknown, right? So surround yourself with people that love you, you know, protect your peace at all costs. Everything that's going on right now in terms of the traumatic images that we're seeing around what's happening to black boys and, and black girls in our country, you know, it's a lot to process through. You know, there's gonna be a level of PTSD that a lot of people experience from this trauma. So again, allow yourself that grace, read the stories. You don't have to look at the photos, at the images, you know, get up every morning and start your day from a place of gratitude. If you, you know, have trouble praying, write it down, right? Create yourself a journal. Make sure you're trying to exercise several times a week, you know, trying to eat uh, good foods and keep a healthy diet. Finding a therapist, as you mentioned, all th most therapists right now are doing work via Zoom and telehealth services. And we're going to see that definitely continue to increase. If you need a therapist, go to therapyforblackgirls.com. Also, psychologytoday.com is another great website, betterhelp.com. Visit our site, silenceofshame.com. Uh, we have a lot of content. Also, we have a podcast on iTunes, Google Play, and SoundCloud. So check us out there. Follow me at ShantiDoss404 and consider making a donation. We're, we're giving free therapy sessions for nurses um, through COVID-19. So you, know, you can donate by texting the word silence to 707070 or visiting the site, as I mentioned. But more than anything, just wake up every morning and ask yourself, you know what? How was yesterday? How did I feel yesterday? And how am I feeling this morning? If you can start processing through those feelings and acknowledging them, <clears throat> then you can get the help that you needed and equip yourself with healthy coping mechanisms and, and come from a place of love. It's so much hate and negativity going on in the world. I think that if we lead from a place of love and service and try to be of service to other people, that it will help you even deal with a lot of your own negative emotions and frustrations. I love it. Shanti, thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. I'm serious. I want to figure out how we can do more to support your Silence to Shame campaign. So I'm going to follow up with you offline. For those of you who joined us today, I know this was a fantastic opener to the Mental Health Breaking the Stigma Summit that we have for Walker's Legacy. I um, am excited to uh, have our next speaker who will be joined after we go into a short DJ interlude with DJ C. Devon. Um, our next speaker is uh, Tiffany Davison Parker of Universal Therapeutic Services, uh, and she will be talking about breaking down the stigma. And this program will be moderated by Kendra Speed, who is the Walker's Legacy City Director for Austin. So DJ C. Devon, if you could take us out here. And Shanti, again, listen, it's <laughs> an honor. So thank you so much for joining us this morning. Same here. Thank you. And before I'm going to log out my video, but I'll type in some of the websites and, and um, resources that I mentioned for everyone that's still on. Perfect. Sounds good. Okay. Bye. Bye. Thanks.